Hi and welcome dear friends and they together with Dennis. Hi Dennis. Hello again. Originally from Denmark, but now living in UK. I properly, yeah, properly tell. You, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> because we all the time tell, tell that Dennis is from UK and say, no, I'm Danish. So we just, uh, yeah, we just properly I am present to you. just there to fix that tea problem. Yeah, okay, okay. So we decided to have a small conversation during our tea session because why are we just not drink tea and also record it and film and talk and whatever? And uh, we had, uh, because we're traveling across Thailand, we're now in Thailand, uh, near our friendly tea factory, and we will try some tea. Pretty unusual process for us. But uh, during our travels, we had a few very good philosophical conversations about mm. business perspectives, about uh, personal realization, whatever goals, achievements, whatever, which mm. is I really appreciate. So we decided uh, to, because we still need to wait one hour till our dinner, we decided why not to drink a tea, had a good talk, at the same some. time eat some cheese and nuts. Yeah, so we have a, a, Taiwan, a Thailand breakfast, oh, Taiwan, Thailand uh, dinner tea ceremony. Sounds good? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe the first question is, we start to talk with you about like, uh, let it be like personal goals. And uh, if, if you think something too personal, just tell me and you cannot uh, tell it uh, for a camera, I don't know. But uh, for me personally, what's very interesting in the conversation, because I often talk to people who are doing businesses or who do jobs, doesn't matter. What is their goal in their life actually? For what are you living? For what are you doing? What is your actually actual goal? And uh, you pretty interesting replied on this question. What do you do decide? Maybe you remember. So there are two ways I can explain this. Uh -huh. One is my personal philosophy. One is using some more acknowledged, more popular terms. I don't really have a goal. Uh -huh. There is nothing in particular that I say, this is the thing, this is the dream, this is the ambition, this is the peak. Uh -huh. This is the target. Uh -huh. So instead, what I like to think, and I work in visual metaphors a lot, is I climb the mountain. And that is to say that some people already know what's, where their goal is and uh, where on the hill or the mountain they, that may be and where they need to go. Mm -hmm. But because I don't really know particularly what it is that is the purpose of my life, instead I just climb the mountain. I mm. keep developing myself, I keep building my own mastery mm -hmm. to follow the saying you know in order to master the world you must first master this self i don't know which part of the world it is i want to master yet and so i just start with myself but uh, what did you mean when you tell about the mastery uh, what kind of mastery do you think is most important for life or for yourself for you it's a good question because it takes many forms recently um, mastery for me has been combination of um, I've been getting into emotional intelligence mm -hmm. I'm working on some of my self-conceptions and some of my limiting beliefs mm -hmm. um, but probably the most significant shift and shift in my personal mastery is I've gone from because in most aspects of my life I acknowledge that I am the bottleneck I'm the limiting factor the only reason why one of any of my 30 something projects is not done is because of myself mm -hmm. because I haven't done it yet so I'm the limiting belief sorry I'm the limiting fact I'm the bottleneck and it's a good thing to be your own bottleneck mm -hmm. it's much I much prefer being the limiting factor as opposed to being limited by somebody else or society mm -hmm. or money or restrictions or qualifications or whatever and so I realized at some point this year that it wasn't about time it wasn't that I didn't have enough time in the day. It was that I didn't have enough energy in the day. Because I'm very good at putting all of my energy into something. And so I run out of energy, just mental bandwidth, before mm -hmm. I run out of time in the day. And so that's a big shift because a lot of people think that, you know, they need to manage their time better. Uh -huh. Their time management, their discipline, their, that's, that's what's stopping them. And they, you know, I, I, one of the biggest problems at, at my, my day job 
It's simply we have too many meetings. Uh, so like too many communication or like interactions or whatever? Just too many meetings in our calendars. I have somewhere between, I have about 40 meetings a week. It's all online, yeah? Yeah. Sometimes we're in the office and life is good, but else I spend 60% uh, of my time on a call. Well, yeah, when we, Easily. Had a call, when we had a call with you, I was we found that you have a kind of uh, very highly well-equipped <laughs> space uh, for online meetings. Oh yeah, I, <laughs> most people ask me if I'm a live streamer because I have the camera, I have the lighting, I have the whole, like I have the professional microphone and everything and it's just yeah. like, nah. Like, you do it only for job, yeah. I do it for my job. People consume me through video calls. But actually people value that, I do believe, because when they oh, hear yeah. you and see you, it's something completely different when we see some other employee. Oh yeah, sometimes I just go to meetings and let the microphone do all the work. The power of sounding like a radio host when everybody else is on like laptop microphones. Yeah. It just makes people stop and listen to you. But so I transitioned into this thinking that mm -hmm. it's not time, it's actually energy. And that's a big shift because when you think about your time, you're constantly thinking about like, how can I create more time there? How can I get up early? How can I fix my bed routine? And da -da 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 -da. You're not thinking about the actual achieving more. Mm -hmm. You're just thinking about all these time things. And so I'm trying a few different experiments with, uh, with, with organizing and focusing and trying to find a ways to give myself more energy instead of giving myself more time. Actually, we're talking about uh, to be more productive and mm. to be more, how to say, effective. Yeah, mm. so be more like precise in what you're doing, like be focused. Mm. Yeah, and it's also uh, one of the things that I'm currently running an experiment on. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that I come from the school of if you want it done, do it yourself. But not everything can be done by yourself. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be done by myself. Oh. And so I'm, I'm now working with, uh, with somebody else and I'm trying to get better at sort of involving other people and sometimes delegating and sometimes outsourcing mm -hmm. and, and leveraging other people. Mm -hmm. So I can focus more of my energy on the things that I need to do. But how are you finding this? Yeah, actually, I really find this uh, special and uh, what I can say that, yeah, we have really uh, similar start in the thing like if you want to something be done pr properly it must be done by yourself uh, the, the do it yourself yeah so and uh, i also was on this side and from perspective of, of uh, like a business owner and also entrepreneur i also seen like okay uh, don't just let it go just let the people do their job and don't uh, let them like uh, be ruled too much, you know, so just let them do and, and at the same time do let you do your thing. So like do your thing as a, as a, as a kind of a philosophy behind it. Yeah. But uh, also later I just understand, okay, for, for my purposes actually, because of course we're talking about our personal perspective and personal vibe about what we're doing, but I just realized that of course it, you still need to rule a lot, you still need to control uh, people from my perspective and and it's still but of course you need to improve your own uh, productivity and uh, improve the quality of what you're doing actually because you can mm. as you rightly said you can spend a lot of time and uh, and the productivity will be much less if you uh, use the wrong algorithms of doing things or you do a lot of monkey job or like uh, micromanagement which is not needed and doesn't matter, is it for personal needs or it's for uh, business needs, whatever. You still need to be like more precise in what you're doing and more focused on the real, not even goal, but maybe, yeah, it's a goal, of course, but there are some steps in goals. Like, mm. okay, this is a, because if, if you only focus on like some general goal, some there, you don't see the steps and you don't get some people don't get things done because of this because they just work in and don't see what's happening around they just whew, the train are going and no one see what's and we don't see the the small steps there's a lot of different perspective i pretty chaotically explained but the main thing i understood that yes yeah, first i need to be more productive second i need to be faster in some point but i already i'm already pretty fast so it's pretty my maybe good part of me that I can do things 
really super fast sometimes, even maybe too fast <laughs> from some point. Uh, but still, personally understand that I can do both. I can do fast and good at the same time and just don't do the thing which I'm not perfect in. If I, I know I, I can't do that perfectly, just delegate it to someone else. For, so, so for example, like in business, I'm not very well in numbers, but luckily I have great partners who can run this thing, you know, and uh, or get employees who can run some whatever, like planning, whatever, so, which I also can, generally I can imagine some and I can see some great picture or big vision, whatever. Uh, but just know your good and bad things. And of course, as you said, you, we can implement uh, some new algorithms and we can create new good habits, which is also, we discussed a few philosophical aspects of you and what I found that you are, very shortly said a lot of very important things which would like uh, accumulate some knowledge in short term, which is important because for me often when I try to explain my own views, especially because English is not my native language, but even uh, in Russian I can do the same, but uh, the thing is just you need to be present and you need to understand where are you, what are you doing, for what you're doing and uh, see very transparently all your mistakes and all your faults and uh, the things which you can learn and do better. Uh, this is super important uh, to at the same time not underestimate yourself, believe in yourself, but at the same time be critical to yourself. It, and mm. it must be in balance because some people, when we start be criticizing about themselves, we start underestimate themselves and we start thinking, oh, I can't do that, I can't do this. But as you right to say, it, you, you, you must think not that I, we can't do something, but we do something not perfectly enough, but we can do it perfectly if we learn more or we train more or we find new way to do it. So this is the thing. Or we find someone who do it instead of us, for example, for us, for our mm -hmm. interests, whatever, if you're talking about business, for example. So this is what I found. I find in, because um, I do a lot of work with Lean Agile and continuous mm -hmm. improvement, mm -hmm. I find the thing with continuous improvement that a lot of people get hung up on is this mm -hmm. letting perfection become the enemy of progress. In reality, it doesn't matter like the fact that you didn't do it perfectly, as you say. The only thing that matters is how did you do it today? Mm -hmm. How can you do it better next time? I see. And as long as you can resolve that, as long mm -hmm. as you can accept that this is how it went today, mm -hmm. This is how we can do it better next time. You can move on with your life. You can stop yeah. thinking about it. And Where's I do it? this a lot. Like every mm -hmm. continuous improvement, or the Japanese use the term Kaizen. Ah, Kaizen. Like Toyota. Uh, which Toyota stands owner. for uh, good change. Mm -hmm. Kaizen. So Sen is good. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kai, if the thing is changed. Don't quote me on no. this. Yeah, but. but and yeah, actually, actually, Toyota popularized it because they introduced it as a process in their actual like factories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Toyota factory actually, it's uh, one of the good examples how we make the process and uh, to all the time implement something new, maybe a small step, but uh, never not, not, not stop, not think, oh mm. yeah, we're done. We, it's, a, it's a worse feeling like, to be, oh yeah, we are so great, done, okay, let's continue on that. No, <laughs> this is uh, never, but actually it it's, uh, comes from the nature of feeling, but we are living entities and we are grow, we are changed, we became older, we have more experience. And as soon as we at least a little bit analyze what we have done, self-compromise, self, uh, how to say, self-compassion, self, uh, and the same time, self-competition. Like when you see, yeah, as you said, you know what the way already passed and analyze this period of time what had done, what had been done, and what you plan to done to have some planning. And at the same time, you see, uh, you need, we need to get the right feedback mm. and true feedback. And, uh, and this is important because for some people, okay, for companies, it's made, maybe a little bit easier because we have it from clients, we have it from employees, we have it from partners, and this is good. Uh, as soon as you have <laughs> uh, a couple of <laughs> employees, at least, you already have this. Uh, but also you must, as a person, sometimes we didn't uh, receive that, like for a family, maybe we just don't tell it or 
or you receive it but it's strong or it's not uh, something um, like a lot of people have problems like with parents or or with uh, family like because they don't receive them as they is or they don't understand them whatever and of course this bring a lot of mental problems in the real life and like it became like a bad habits at the same time bad behaviors and and you don't even can uh, you can't even analyze yourself properly because it was for a long time uh, recognize it uh, wrong or, or not accepted or whatever so this is of course this brings a lot of frustration into daily daily lifestyle and for those for these people for this kind of people I think it's most difficult from business or from work perspective to develop it better because you have so many of your own problems and complexes whatever so uh, this uh, also so this um, what you actually what do you do in your so work in uh, balancing this personal stuff also mm. I do believe how, how often you met it in, in work in work uh... so we actually break um, down our work into three yeah. sort of areas of competencies mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is what we're going to help the organization with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the the two are clues in the title lean agile mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we focus we work with the organization around agile and maximizing the value delivered mm -hmm. not just money but value mm -hmm. and that's have this model I call the value loop because mm -hmm. it's not just about the company it's a society society it's a company mm -hmm. it's about the person to the team and the team to the product and the product to the company and the company to society sorry the product or service to society mm -hmm. the stakeholders the users the customers mm -hmm. and then society into the company and the company back to the person and so this like loop full is self feedback like yeah this is this positive value feedback loop the self-reinforcing value loop and that's uh -huh. something I work to build into mindset because... So don't lose this loop. In don't some lose point. the loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. you got to have the value. The, the company has to provide value to mm -hmm. the person working at the company. The person in the company has to provide value yeah. into the teams. Teams yeah. have to provide value into services or products. Mm -hmm. The services or product has to provide value into society. So society in turn provides value to the company. Mm -hmm. And that reinforces the loop. So that's the first thing. That's that, John. And then we have lean, and mm -hmm. lean is a lot about finding waste. Mm -hmm. And the, the key wastes that, that I like to talk about is not one of the original seven, but it is actually what we now call the eighth waste of lean. Mm -hmm. And that is the waste of human potential. Aha. Uh -huh. So like, one. for example, some, so for, for interruption, just for some reason, uh, some uh, employee, for example, have some uh, skills which you just um, not used. Yeah, we're um, talking about that. When we're talking about like organizations, um, the thing that defines the most effective organizations mm -hmm. in the world right now is their ability to solve problems. Because innovating is a problem. Getting mm -hmm. into a new market is a problem. Updating their product, be it delivering good service, these are all problems. So the most effective companies are really the best problem-solving companies. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be really good at solving problems, you need to leverage people. Mm -hmm. Because process doesn't solve problems, machines doesn't solve problems, it's people. People solve problems. Mm -hmm. You can automate a thing, and automating a required step is also a problem. And so, in a lot of times, we work to figure out, like, what are the problems we have? How can we, how can we leverage people? And one of the most classic examples is, why are we having someone do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? when we could automate that and that person could now go on to the next problem and start solving the next problem mm -hmm. and that may require further automation or things because and yeah and so moving on from leaving into the third thing finally the third competency area is people mm -hmm. because we've established that organizations are fueled by people mm -hmm. that we leverage people to not just deliver new value but also solve existing problems so uh -huh. everything comes back to people and so, okay, now we have a group of people. Everything else is, is sort of resolved by these people. We have a group of people that make up this organization. Mm -hmm. And they have to work with each other. Yeah. And they have to grow each other and grow themselves. And so yeah. we come into these people competency of giving feedback, mm -hmm. of leadership, of establishing psychological safety. Mm -hmm. and, and how did, what is a, maybe just you can bring some example, how do you deliver that because I can imagine that some people maybe for them is difficult to accept because there be a pretty high level of transparency to share this like okay share like your personal problems but at the same time not too much or you just bring too much personality 
into daily workflow, which is also maybe not so good, but how did you manage that? I'm actually really happy to be working with the company I'm working with now. It's a mm -hmm. company called Smart Pension. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that they've done is they have decided to say that every single manager mm -hmm. needs to go through this training. That's They call it the Becoming Leaders training, but it's essentially revolving around Mm -hmm. leadership skills mm -hmm. and leadership boils down to influencing other people to action mm -hmm. that is what leadership is managing is a little bit different because managing has some process and authority involved but leadership fundamentally comes down to influencing other people mm -hmm. towards outcome towards mm -hmm. action actually i like this word influencing not ruling but influencing no. that this comes is... into spheres of control so there's this mm -hmm. you have you have to help me keep track of all the tangents mm -hmm. but when we talk about control and influence, you have three spheres. It's another model, it's quite popular. You have your sphere of control. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you can control directly. You have the sphere of influence, the things that you can influence. Mm -hmm. And you have your sphere of concern, which is the things that you can only be concerned about. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm gonna skip some years of self-discovery now and just give you the cheat answer here. <laughs> the only thing in your sphere of control is yourself. Control, <laughs> because uh, you can control. You, you can't control other people. You can influence them, but you can't control them. Yeah, that's right. They said you can rule, but rule is that's be the rude word. You can influence. Rule influence better because you cannot wave a magic wand and you cannot make them do things. You can influence them to do things. You can pressure them to do things. You can, and again, we talk about pressure. We talk about exerting your influence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not uh, like ah, do that thing. And then just... we can we can again take a shortcut here, and we can roughly break down. Um, Goldman did a good piece of work on this, breaking leadership down into six sort of categories. Of you have commanding, which is like go do that now. It's like military. Think military. I see. You have pace setting, which is this is how we do it. Now go and do it. Uh huh. I see you do a lot of pace setting. Sometimes. It's like this is how it needs to be done. This is how you do it. Replicate. Do what I do. Yeah. Follow me, let's go. Mm -hmm. Then we have, there's a, there's three that are more managery and then there's three that are more soft. So mm -hmm. there's like free hard and free soft. So we mm -hmm. have commanding, we mm -hmm. have pace setting, we have visionary. Mm -hmm. That is say, this is the goal, this is where you, we're going, your feedback is welcome, but this is where we're going. Go. But you don't show the right, uh, how to say, right steps. You do also, like you said, pace setting is what, what you say that pace is. Pace setting is, yeah, where you are. Like, when you show how to do yeah, it. Yeah, when you're but setting the pace. You are mm -hmm. setting but visionary the visionary is just uh, more, you must to be more in, in, intuitive, like in what we're doing. So just we find the right person and you trust this manager, for example, you just give him, do that. There is a vision, there is a goal, go yeah. your way, actually. I yeah. can see the path between the trees. Mm -hmm. I can see the light between the trees. Follow me. Yeah, so we it's, can, we it's can. also about trust, a little bit. Also about trust, you need trust. Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of classic examples of visionary leaders, uh, for better or for worse, is probably Steve Jobs. Because mm -hmm. he had very clear vision, like this is where we're going, this is what it needs to be, this is what we're doing, follow me. Your feedback is welcome, but no, we're not having front-facing audio on the iMac. I see. It needs to be clean, that is my vision. Mm -hmm. And so the three softer sides are democratic leadership. Mm -hmm where you're getting people's consent, their buy-in, their, they become part of the owners of the action. Mm. Because it's free, hard leadership styles. It's very much about like, this is my action. This is what we're doing. The free softer are a little bit, a little bit more about this is our action. And it helps to build ownership, helps to get people involved. Because once they feel ownership, they will themselves find ways to help achieving it. Mm -hmm. And so, you have democratic, which is, should be fairly self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Then you have affiliative, which is mm -hmm. where you're building relationships with people and you're leveraging these relationships. But this can be a big problem with relations, relation builded leadership, actually, because there'll be like, uh, if, for example, you break relations or go too close to employees, for example, or mm. it can be like, but it's also one of these things that enables us to go and build psychological safety because it's humanizing. Mm -hmm. 
if you are just this cold function person, if mm -hmm. people see you as a function, that is to say, he's the CEO, mm -hmm. this is what the CEO does, they see him as a function. Mm -hmm. That's where we maybe recommend people use a little bit more of the affiliative leadership style to get a little bit more familiar with it because it helps to establish relations that I am a human. Mm -hmm. I am Dennis. I have my own feelings, my own emotions, my own mental state. I'm not just a function. Mm -hmm. I'm a person. Mm -hmm. um, one of Lisa Atkins, the, the, one of the advice Lisa Atkins gives, and Lisa Atkins is a person who wrote the book on agile coaching, mm -hmm. bringing professional coaching yeah. into what we call agile coaching. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the challenges that she writes in her books is go about your day. Now mm -hmm. imagine a letter above everybody's head. It can either be I for an individual, when you see them as a person, how they're feeling today, what their goal is today, their perspective, mm -hmm. or O for obstacle. You see them for what you need from them, from what, how they play into the things that you're doing, how they play into the, how you're feeling, how they are as a component of the puzzle that you must solve. Yeah, but still it must be mutual, I think, it must be exchanging uh, the views, like, okay, we have a, you have a sharing, sharing perspective of... of um, and it turns out when you start, yeah, and it is mutual, but once, as soon as you start seeing them as an individual, mm -hmm. you start having empathy, mm -hmm. because empathy, uh, we use a lot of exercises to kickstart empathy, but basically, Empathy can be very easily kick-started mm -hmm. as soon as you get you just need to get them people to see other people as people with emotions and with states and with be as beings and not just obstacles mm -hmm. and as soon as you start talking to somebody with empathy They respond with empathy Most exactly. of the time exactly. Yeah, and but I if you see them as an obstacle as a challenge They mm -hmm. see you as an obstacle as a challenge mm, I see. And then the last leadership style is the coaching leadership style Mm -hmm. which is where you're stepping in, you're seeing things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. You are in driving action through them. And you believe which is the best or it's the best in combination? So this is one of the, the, the challenges that, that Goldman... So my personal opinion is there is no best. Mm -hmm. I have ones that I use a lot of the time and I try to get better in others. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm trying to find the correct balance between sort of pace setting mm -hmm. and sort of visionary and a few other things because I'm mm -hmm. trying to get better at delegating and that requires me to use some of the harder leadership styles that I'm not so used to. Mm -hmm. And Goldman went and uh, it's quite a good book. I can recommend it at some point. Goldman? Daniel Goldman. Daniel he, Goldman. Wrote, he wrote a book on emotional intelligence yeah. that sort of summarized a lot of like basically the progress we've made in understanding some neurochemistry and some emotional states and how we work mm -hmm. kind of how we're wired to work. Mm -hmm. Especially when it's interacting with other people and things like how adrenaline affects our ability to be creative and mm -hmm. use empathy and you know how fight, flight, freeze kind of plays into certain situations. Anyways. And yeah, they're all good at different situations because if you're, say, under mortar fire, mm -hmm. you want to be command. You want to like get into cover, go into the trench, like mm -hmm. f shoot back. You don't want to be like, okay, gang, how are we going to solve this problem? <laughs> because then you'll be hit with the mortar and everybody will be dead. Mm -hmm. But similarly, if you don't know the solution, you don't just want to start barking orders. You may want to, and you leverage the full perspective. To diff this, if you have a team of 10 people, you want to leverage those 10 different perspectives, those 10 different creative people, mm -hmm. their experiences, their skill sets into finding the best way to solve this new problem. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, uh, the, the work you do, uh, you really work in very broad positions and perspectives. So like from firstly find, like you said, uh, underestimated uh, skills or like uh, more, uh, like human potential like mm. in the teams yeah and also some communication which can be done and also which i found but you know i, I didn't i don't have any kind of this education and which is good and bad uh, and in a good part i just i organically found something which is like logically you see oh yeah if, if it's it's worked this way uh but yes now i just uh, in a point which to get some kind of education and uh, even maybe not courses but uh just to listen to those who already had 
good experience in building the things I do. Uh, not in the same, like say, business, but same kind of uh, organizing and uh, actual ruling the company, whatever. But uh, interesting that uh, this uh, kind of uh, combinations, uh, I do believe that, yeah, for me it's also this uh, pay setting uh, and plus visionary plus maybe kind of coaching. It all can work uh, as a like a one gene, like one combination. You not randomly. Oh yes, now we are we train this way, or we go that uh, uh, visionary thing, or we just uh, setting people to feel this kind of balancing uh, on stones, whatever. But just uh, to try implement as more as possible uh, pos positive uh, things, so we. The people at the same time feel responsibility and at the same time feel good feedback and same time feel needed level of appreciation and uh, and it all works as a, a good uh, balance so they feel really um, i think it's needed actually it's needed uh, it's really for for uh, and yeah yeah part of what i do because i also do like leadership training mm -hmm. so say i do a you're right, it's so broad. I do everything from going in with teams, figuring out what is their workflow, how do they deliver value, and then help them like map that out, identify ways to establish process and practices, and mm -hmm. help them sort of from a very practical on the ground level to all the way up to like, I sit down and I coach people and I talk them through like leadership styles and I talk them through like how they're able to build their own awareness of like what their leadership style is and how they're using it and like what situations that's good in and what situations they, need, they may need to start practicing other leadership styles mm -hmm. and you'll see this like in your organization because mm -hmm. you have people in your organization who mm -hmm. are very good at dealing with certain kinds of situation mm -hmm. and that'll be reflected in you can start to see like actually yeah this person who's really good at dealing with issues no. has a really good some of those harder leadership styles because they can step in and they can find like yeah okay do this do this do this they can mobilize people mm -hmm. and you have other people at other times who are really good as like managers because mm -hmm. they can go in and they can work with the person and they can really help develop the person mm -hmm. and understand what the person's problem is mm -hmm. so the first is just maybe open the person actually so for example like when you first starting to work with a kind of a team i think maybe the first step is just we just let know a bit, bit more about the team about mm -hmm. each member and to find the best how to say the best skills, best uh, values inside the person might be the most important thing I do believe here. Yeah? Part of working with a new team or a new person is like we start with observing mm -hmm. because it's very easy to go into a new team and then see the surface of what they're doing and start solutionizing. It's like, oh, you should do this, you should try that. Mm -hmm. But it's not so important what they're doing because what they're doing is the bottom tier. That's process and practices. Mm -hmm. The important thing is understand why they're doing it. What the background, what is the, what is the mindset, what is the values, what is the principles, what is the experience, what's the history, what's the thing that went wrong seven months ago, which is why they're doing it this way. I see. What is the like weird kink in the machine that means that they're not doing it in the most efficient way, because if they did it in the most efficient way, that actually would break the production line. Yeah, I see. It's, it's not what, it's why. Yeah, actually, I really believe that one of the most important things we discuss is the habits and behavior. Like, mm. for example, because we do we do uh, reprogram ourselves, we really program. <laughs> you want to say something about tea? <laughs> Strong enough? <laughs> yeah, we actually you know, for small uh, we trying our uh, local highly roasted ulun tea and highly fermented ulun tea, which like almost like black tea or red tea but but it's all on do you like it interesting it's really curious unusual and it's also it's compressed into the cakes it's also unusual no one done the cakes from this tea before <laughs> let's talk about tea a little but yeah. on one hand yeah you get, you get that like roasted but it's also i think i don't know if it's the fermentation or what it is but it, yeah, it's, it's just like fresh not like i'm trying to find the right verb Mm -hmm. But like, um, you know, like pickles have a certain freshness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that same kind of freshness, not the taste of pickles or anything, but like yeah, that yeah. same kind of like a little bit a refreshing feeling. Yes, I, I understood what you're meaning. Not sour, but yeah, it's in, it, uh, interesting. Uh, also, actually, the tea. Also, cheese? Yeah, I've already taken that. <laughs> we got snacks. We got <laughs> special ceremony. <laughs> About the habits, actually, this is a very good habit to drink tea. Very good habit to drink tea. 
Do you I, find, the, sorry for interruption, do you find that tea is useful for your work? It helps you or to concentrate or... I wouldn't be a third of the way where mm -hmm. I am now without tea, because tea is how I deal with stress. Uh -huh. On one hand, you can say, okay, massive quantities of caffeine when you're already stressed is perhaps not the most sustainable thing, Dennis. Like, yeah. well, but, only, only caffeine, actually, and tianine and GABA and other... Tea is how I, like, maintenance myself. Mm -hmm. So, tea is the thing that gives me, like, every 45 minutes to 90 minutes, that is my little moment of respite, that is my little moment of mindfulness, that is my little moment of reset and taking a step back mm -hmm. and like just breathing and then getting back into the action. It's my little pit stop mm -hmm. tea. And it's sometimes, it's the thing, it's a very, I've had not fun times in my life. I've had very stressful times in my life. I've had times in my life, where if you're talking about like Maslow's pyramids of Maslow's mm -hmm. hierarchy of needs and we're mm -hmm. talking about like, oh, self-actualization is great. Mm -hmm. That was only quite recently I started tapping into self-actualization mm -hmm. and the name of the game became really to focus on becoming the fullest best person of myself. Mm -hmm. I've had times where it's a matter of like, do I have a place I can go back to, that I can retreat to, that I can feel safe in? There was times when that was tea and not say an apartment or house or, or friends or family because I was in another country or I didn't have a really safe place to live or there were some other issues or stress or something. And so tea is the thing that's been a constant. Yeah, you have the tea anyway, everywhere. doesn't matter where you go, are you alone or with uh, friends, new, old friends, whatever, or just to... Actually, I really agree with you because I really can understand you also move to other country and you live in different cities. Uh, of course, you had this. I had a similar experience, maybe even more, because I over time constantly traveling. And uh, last four years, I had super challenging time, which is really like to move to other country, to mm. Europe, and start completely new life, and also without a big support of friends because it was during COVID. Mm. I, I, I planned to bring my family earlier and my uh, employees and friends earlier, but it was impossible. I was alone, actually, and slowly f developing absolutely new circle of communication. And uh, even also, yeah, I have one renting flat, second renting flat, finally, I moved to my flat uh, recently also. And you know, uh, for me, there's also some little bit difference in this touch. I like to collect in teaware and stuff mm -hmm. and like all these antiques and small objects like, okay, let it be like teaware, teapots, all these tra traditional Chinese, Taiwanese stuff. And as soon as I assemble the shelves with my teaware, which I can take out and brew the tea and uh, invite some friends and I'll, I'll take this teaware with my back for traveling, like whatever, I feel like, okay, yeah, yes, I ground it a little bit. I have this space. Uh, it's a physical thing. Of course, mm. uh, yeah, I feel the same while we're just drinking tea here. I also go to the state which is more comfortable and more mm, like, uh, yeah, really like bringing me to more normal and more comfortable state. But still, when you have any physical place, like, yeah, this is my tea place, uh, it also helps you. It's maybe a little bit uh, feti fetishism in it, like, because I'm a big fan of this, uh, how to say, let's let, let call it like space of objects, which is relates to tea and tea ceremony, because a little bit more deep into like uh, small things and all this gameplay uh, with the tea. But I do believe the deepness you can choose, but still tea is a product, like a state. Yeah, we have tea. It can become something different way. It can be ceremony or it can be like a mug and good tea in it and good water and that's also enough. But main thing is, and still we're still back to this creating other kind of uh, habits, like a uh, behavior, which we have when we start interacting with the, the, the tea, we start be friends with tea. And I in the, and sometimes understand and I associate tea and tea drinking uh, sometimes with uh, something bigger than just a consumption drink. Uh, for me, it's also a lifestyle and uh, maybe a philosophy and, and also, yeah, I'm not doing too much. I, I, I'm doing tea, tea wear, and this is the two things. Mindfulness, I'm right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, we, we just, yeah, we just focused on this and all my business and all my friends 
and all my relations 99.9 .9 somehow relates to tea. Maybe it's too big focus, but I like this preciseness. Like, okay, mm. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, so. Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah, of course, easy. What is the worst cup of tea you've ever had? <laughs> Actually, uh, what I can say, maybe it's if, when, I, when we have a bad uh, water, what I can say, the bad water, then you have, you can have bad tea, okay, let it be like super simple tea bag from big brand. There's still tea in it and I not drink it. I prefer drink water than this. But if I drink it and if it was a good water, it, I can associate it. Okay, I had a simple cheap tea. But it was tea. But I prefer not drinking. But if I some for some accidental reason I try it, I would be not like, oh okay, it was a worse tea. But some, somehow for me, the worst experience when I have like good tea, for example, and I know it's good, and I arrive someplace and I don't have good water, which can open up it perfectly, and I have a cold water, this underboiled water, or it's a poor quality tap water, whatever and I brew this good tea with this water and it's so bad. And especially if I had to present it to some friends and we just planned some, it was sometimes you, you wait for this, oh, we will sit and drink tea there in this beautiful place, which I often do in a travel, whatever. And we just, oh yeah, we will sit and enjoy the tea finally. And you brew, brew this tea with this bad water. And this, yeah, this is a really bad cup of tea. I have a couple of times like that. And all the time I was really, upset about this because especially if I was it was uh, impossible to get new different water boil it freshly so this is maybe most upsetting because all the rest which is not uh, just a tea in a way somewhere like aromatize the tea stuff, I just don't drink it I prefer water and also uh, which is very good with me uh, but some people have a really pretty strong addiction from tea they just if you don't take a cup of tea in the morning they'll feel not so good. For example, like yesterday, we only had, or well, even today, we had first cup of tea like 4 p.m. already, and I was okay when I slept only four hours, and still okay. I just don't have this dependency. Okay, here we are on travel, and we want to factory, and we're working a lot, and it, okay, it's different thing. But even when I'm alone, I'm drink really less tea, and I don't uh, drink it each day, all the time. I do prefer social communication. Uh, with just consumption. So if I have a good reason, I will can drink like four times, ten times a day because I have a good people to meet and to talk with them and I, it's important for me. Or I need to, to, for a walk to try some new types, I also can drink a lot. But as soon as I don't have a reason, I can drink once or even nothing. And, I, and this helps to really enjoying the process and if I have ability to get this uh, worst cup, I just don't get it. If I know, uh, yeah, it's tea bag. Okay, no, thank you. I will drink water. That or was the warm up question. Juice. Yeah. Are you ready for the real question? I hope that uh, you put this up on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, of course. And I, I would suggest it. that uh, maybe maybe put it to your editor to see if they can find a few good clips to make like short like YouTube shorts of. Uh, it's possible. Actually, we can do, and because actually it's a very good uh, topic. And I think that uh, this conversation is useful, hmm. especially for anyone, actually, for everyone. And uh, this is what I'm curious, because we've discussed about tea and we talk tea is more than just consumption. It's more than just leaves in a pot. It's also about the experience. It's also about the situation you're in, the place mm -hmm. you're in, the people mm -hmm. you're with. And so if we talk about the experience mm -hmm. and I ask, what is your worst tea experience? What is the worst moment that you can connect to tea in your life? And I can go first if you like. Okay, let you do first. I, I was thinking about, about it first because I have so many experience. And imagine like last month I was in 10 countries and all the time traveling and see each day a few people and just it, it. And it's not just a random month. It's just all my life is like this. So I have maybe over experienced it in some point. That's why I'm curious to know. but. <laughs> I will share. And this is also yeah. a little bit of an exercise in being, you know, mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is yours? So the worst cup of tea mm -hmm. I've ever had mm -hmm. was from 
Incidentally, it stands as the worst cup of tea, not just in terms of like the situation that I had it in, mm -hmm. but also just my disappointment with the actual tea. Mm -hmm. And that was 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. on my last night in Dublin, because mm -hmm. I used to live near Dublin. Uh -huh. So my last night in Dublin, 11 p.m. The only place that was open that you could go and get a cup of tea in was McDonald's. One of the biggest companies in the world, by the way, terrible tea. Fix it, please. Otherwise, call us. We'll fix it for you. Okay. <laughs> Short advertisement implementation. <laughs> McDonald's, call us. Call us. There's a link below. I'll leave it uh, my personal yeah. and <laughs> for Dennis also. Some please. Yeah. Okay. Prior to this, I'd gone to down to the end of O'Connell Street. Mm -hmm. Because the way Dublin works is in the middle of Dublin, you have O'Connell Street, which is this big two lane street and they have the big spire, like giant metal needle in the middle. And if you want to go out to where I lived in, you know, the suburbs or the mm -hmm. outskirts, like this little sleeper town on the mm -hmm. outskirts of Dublin, you go down the end of O'Connell Street, you turn right, there's a little corner shop, you turn right and then 20 meters down the street is bus stop. So naturally I'm an autopilot. I turn right, I see people waiting for the bus. I walk down to the bus stop and about 12 meters down to the bus stop, my brain kicks in. It's like, Dennis, what the fuck are you doing? Excuse my language. Yeah. Turn around. There's a guy on the street laying face down with his face in a pool of his own blood. Mm -hmm. Old dude. You were just walking down to these people who are just standing there like nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you ignoring this dude? I managed to take two steps past him before. It's like, no, 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 no. We need to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And so my whole evening, I missed my bus, I had to find like difficult way home. I had to get like the, the weird like 1 a.m. bus, like the, the night bus to back home. And so my whole, that whole evening was taken over by getting this guy up, you know, making sure he doesn't like pass out because he's clearly like fallen and he's hit his head on a metal grate and he had a wound in his head about that big and he was like laying with his Crazy. face in this blood and people were just walking by. They're just going down waiting for their bus stops. Sadly, it's all often... It's called the bystander effect. Mm -hmm. And we innately default to what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. we, we take normality in crowds, in mm -hmm. other people. If people are like standing next to a car crash with their phones up, we, that is the normal thing to do. Then we have to mentally take over and like, actually, wait, hold on, what the fuck are we doing? Let's go and get the people out of the car. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, could, we of, of course we got the guy up and I sort of... Uh, I commanded a few random people to help me out here, mm -hmm. but we got the guy up, made sure he didn't like pass out because he, it's really bad to go unconscious if you're taking a mm -hmm. hit to your head. Um, we went, I went into the local corner store, mm -hmm. I uh, did the root thing and I was like, yeah, no, barged through the queue. Mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, no, we need an ambulance and I need something to try this guy up with. And then by the end of it all, I was quite shaken up because I'd had a nice calm evening and then suddenly it went from like zero to a hundred of getting this guy into an ambulance and mm -hmm. I do what I always do after every traumatic thing you drink tea. first thing I do is find the nearest cup of tea mm -hmm. my physics exam I had this uh, in, in, in school I had my mm -hmm. last physics exam kind of went a little bit uh, up in a ball of flame mm -hmm. no literally my mm -hmm. physics exam went up in a not mine but the girl in front of me Mm -hmm. up in a bowl of actual flame. She had third degree burns, the, the, like, the room was on fire, it was a whole thing. I lost my favorite vest to beating the crap out of a table <laughs> because the table was on fire. Wow. And I was just, I took the first thing and just started. And so naturally I'm, I'm now walking the streets of Dublin trying to find at 11 p.m. in the evening. I'm like, I called my, um, because I was 18 at this time. <sighs> I can imagine. I was 18. 18. And so I was like calling, I was like calling my father because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the physics thing. As soon as we're like, okay, this girl is packed up. She's ready to go into the ambulance. I was like, can I go home now? I was like, yeah, okay. I stepped outside and called my father. Mm -hmm. Cause he's very also calm under pressure. We go into like, you know, you, when you go into command mode mm -hmm. and then afterwards you can have shock and you can have like whatever you need to deal with. So I called my father, go find a cup of tea. And eventually the only place I find that's open is McDonald's. So I go into McDonald's and I was like, can I have a cup of tea, please? And they served me the most disappointing gray sludge. <sighs> that's like steam, you know, when it's like machine milk and it's like the whatever steamed like milk that tastes like, like they put milk and it's like the weakest thing ever. And it's like, <laughs> like just crazy. I can imagine actually, yeah, it's also important, not only the 
tea, but the moment you get it, the tea, actually, because it also, you very important that you tell the story, because the story behind, and the, also, with, with whom you drink tea, like, in which actual atmosphere, in which actual moment you drink tea. For example, if you like, it's, if it's like your support, the tea is our support, the tea is our zone of comfort, and as soon as we, it's uh, in the moment that you really need it, we get it in so bad quality or disappointing tastes and experience, of course, it's uh, even feel more stronger disappointment. Yeah. But that, what I want to say about the uh, shortcut about the incident you had, because when you just randomly pass with, uh, from the people who had really strong problem and or something like accident on the street, whatever, you know, in China, it's really more common even when in Western world, for example, because I used to spend so long time in China. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons which is pretty strange that way afraid that if you uh, go to help uh, later on you can be recognized as a person who was a reason of this of its problem of uh, oh it's fallen or you beat him whatever or sh her or whatever this is why like the, you during a car crash when you just if you like beat uh, person people uh, on, on the street uh, yeah. they sometimes even don't stop and they have a big problem with this in America too, because yeah. in America, because of how their health insurance works, yeah. if you've been in an accident yeah. and you need to, sometimes to get your health insurance, you need to mm -hmm. sue somebody. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so they sue the medic, if the medic did something, like if there's something like that, mm -hmm. like the first responders, like they have to sue them uh -huh. in order to say like, they have to, you know, the same like you have to file a police report in order to get your insurance for your mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. If you're in a medical accident, you have to like, Somebody is at fault because you can't be at fault. If you're at fault, the insurance won't cover it. That's crazy. So you often, if you don't have a moral feeling about what you're doing something wrong, you can just easily sue the person who actually saved your life, whatever, for example. Yeah, because a, like in, a, in, in, in getting you out of the car, they might have like broken your arm or something in, yeah. like in order to get you out of the burning car or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and it doesn't really, if the other person also has insurance, then mm -hmm. it's like, thing but it's like it's so <laughs> terrible but it's not issue suing each other instead of like, helping each other our, that's crazy that's crazy this uh legacy is this um uh, yeah I what i can say about the experience actually about tea i have few residents and and uh, they're maybe not so dramatic but in general mostly it was connected to like uh, was a tea drunk too much because i drink tea for work and i do tea tastings and once i had like super bad feeling about high blood pressure uh, and it was like two three years ago now i do some checkups and i'm okay but uh, don't drink too much this is the main rule yeah and just drink water eat some food uh, this is why i eat pretty much especially now and just yeah and just, i just doing that because when you drink a lot of tea uh, it's okay i already i already eat more than half already <laughs> so you need to say some food and i had one incident when I just drink 57 types of poor shoe poor tea in one day on two free tea factories. And it was super high amount of caffeine, like, like maybe I drink maybe eight liters of tea in a day or even 10, whatever, a lot, a lot. And you need to try because regularly when we tea, on these tea testings, especially in India, Sri Lanka, and all this English style tea testing, then you just and speed it. You have a special vessel for speeding, whatever. In China, we don't have it. We drink. And uh, sometimes we also speed, but uh, we also have this European style tea, tea tasting in some places. But uh, all this rule style or Gunfu Cha style of brewing didn't uh, don't have it. We just drink it. Or drink a little. This is why we have these small cups for tasting. We just drink a little bit. And uh, for that, for some certain reasons, I don't know, sometimes I don't done that properly. And, and I had this kind of tea drunk state, which is actually sometimes is good if it's okay. Like what, like for now we drink food on a factory, we drink food years here, it's okay. But when you drink like too much and it's, you really feel not so good. And I, and I all, most of my experiences was like, uh, because I drink too much and it was not super, super bad experience. Because, you know, as soon as I start to take tea serious, I start travel with this beautiful bag. So I all the time have my tea with me. 
I, I can never imagine even a, a situation where I really want tea and I don't have my own. So if I want tea, I think, okay, guys, I need the water. This is why I tell you first about the water, because only thing I get from outside is the water. I have my own tea. And uh, this helps you to don't have any situation when we just have really bad tea on the street because you don't drink any tea on the street. Or if you start drinking it, it means, means that I was ready to have this experience, like for educational purposes. Like I traveled to Hamburg and I walked through all these traditional European tea houses, which are absolutely not familiar. What is it? And all this tea with sugar and cakes. Oh, yeah. I am super strange. Prepare yourself because I'm, you're going to leave that at the hotel when we go to London. Yes, yes, I, I will. I will. I already prepared. And I, and I will not tell that I had bad experience because I was prepared uh, and to be entertained. And, and, and I recognize uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, experience as a, you know, okay, I, I recognize it as a experience. I don't recognize it as a, okay, I, I will have a good tea here. I know it, it, it will be something, but I may be, be surprisingly like amazed by the quality somehow i don't know maybe it will be super tea and i just don't know that okay maybe <laughs> some areas but mostly like yeah. because the, the purpose of you know what we're going to be doing in london is not to necessarily find the best we, we are going to go to some places that have some nice tea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of the, the ob objective is to experience how the british drink tea mm -hmm. yeah experience yeah, the the british way of life and specifically the parts that involve tea it's we don't need to do everything. Like we don't need to go to Manchester and then develop the sense that people from Manchester are somehow superior to other people who are not from Manchester. You know who you are. <laughs> I don't know yet. So, Dennis, we had a great conversation. I think you will, we will definitely have more. But I think for uh, like a first, uh, it will be first series of our kind of philosophical discussions. <laughs> and I really like to share because what I really love in tea, that tea really work as a magnet for certain people and it's absolutely works and it absolutely works differently because it was so i already say that before when we film different topic and but it was so special how we met like we walk on a market in amsterdam and it just there was a tourist there and they met on the street and i somehow told you oh you know i will have a tea tour and somehow like you join this tour and and even like all the rest uh, more people just moved to the second day, so we have like kind of private travel because we already planned this travel. And it's so essentially, but I really found that you are the right person who I really appreciate and who I really feel uh, we're sharing uh, a lot of similarity in our values and how we mm. developing ourselves and our relations and our workflow and our whatever. And so it's, it's a good opportunity for me also because uh, you are from different culture, you're from different perspective and education and even your tea experience is completely different you are from uh, take mostly from sri lanka and uh, you are focused but you still focus on good taste and good uh, tea and it's it's very interesting that we are from like parallel parallel universe <laughs> but they have the same values and this is uh, so for me it's uh, very complimentary and Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank and you. The same. Yeah, I was I was only at the market for for a series of random events that involved <laughs> like European like train cancellations uh -huh. and like rail work and the rain and like um, the person I was traveling with and just a series of things mm. that somehow went wrong but somehow led me to the market to ask to <laughs> at the right time mm -hmm. the right thing asking the right question being told that actually, yeah, the guy who wrote this book is here at the market, and if you wait for around for a bit, he'll be here, and you can you can talk to about him about the book. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Anna called me because yeah. he wasn't there. I, I was not on the on the. On the oh, was that Anna? Yeah, yeah, Anna. Anna. yeah, yeah. I see, I see. And yeah, and I came back, and and the thing that I told people is like, of all the people mm -hmm. in Amsterdam, I ran into like not just the tea guy, but mm -hmm. basically imagine me, but like 10, 12 years in the future. Well, and people just go like. I was like, yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, it was super, <laughs> super cool. Guys, thank you for watching this video. And I hope, please leave your comments below. It's very, really appreciate that. And because I'm still like pretty new camera on English YouTube, uh, because I have my Russian speaking YouTube, it's pretty one big one, but English one is still developing. So I really appreciate your feedback and comments. And 
some questions maybe for Dennis because uh, I think that his profession is also very valued and very interesting all these psychological aspects of job and how to improve your productivity and how to build good team and over your leadership uh, coaching things it's very important also I believe uh, Dennis contact below you can also talk to him directly for these topics but okay. also we will definitely meet again with him and you're interested in this kind of type of conversation please tell as soon as we have good comments and good questions, we will meet again and film something else. Yeah? Fantastic, yeah. Thank no, you very much. There is a thing you must remember to say yeah. on English YouTube. Yeah. And that is, first of all, thank you also. I'm Dennis from yeah. ST. Uh, thank you for the chat. Yeah. Thank you for the tea. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And now, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.